Okay, opening words today, an excerpt from a poem called Travel by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Traveling is to become worldly. It's to meet other people. It's to return to the beginning. It's to start offering a hand, learning from the strong. It's to feel solitude. Traveling is leaving home. It's dressing crazy, saying everything and nothing in a postcard. <laughs> it's sleeping in another bed. It's feeling that time is short. Traveling is to go back. Human Family by Maya Angelou. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I note the obvious differences between or each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Originally from Colombia, Sofia and David are scholars, parents, and lovers of life. Their reflections on the joys and challenges of North Dakota living will help us reflect on some of the big questions. The relationship between culture and place, the role of community in shaping who we are, and what it means to be human. Good morning. Good morning. I feel very tall here. <laughs> Uh, which is not a usual feeling for me. So today we want to talk to you about our journey north from Colombia to North Dakota. And this is a journey that has shaped our perception of place, community, and people. And through this journey, we've searched for authenticity through our professional and cultural backgrounds. So to give you a little bit of uh, like a background of, uh, about our country and ourselves, Colombia is located in the northwest tip of South America. It has a population of about 48 million people within an area of 440,000 square miles, which is roughly the same size as Texas or six times the size of North Dakota. And yeah. so uh, it's the only country in South America that has two coastlines on both the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. It's also, so it's, it's bordered by Venezuela, Brazil, Peru, and Ecuador. And on the Northwest by Panama, which used to be part of Colombia until President Theodore Roosevelt uh, bought Panama to be independent. So that, that's a connection there. So uh, Colombia is a, uh, uh, one of the most biologically di diverse countries on earth. It hosts a great variety of species within its, within its uh, rainforests in the Amazon, its mountain ranges in the Andes, its vast savannas in the southeastern uh, Llanos, which it shares with Venezuela. It has deserts and, as I said, coastlines on both oceans, so it's, there's, there's a high diversity of species down there. Uh, about nature and society, Catholicism was the official religion in Colombia from the Spanish uh, colonization until uh, constitutional reform in 1991. There is now separation between church and state, but Catholicism is still the predominant religion by number of adherents. There, uh, in terms of ethnicity and race, uh, we come from three main groups, which is uh, Amerindians, uh, Africans, uh, Africans and Caucasians, and Colombian cuisine is very varied and it changes, it varies by region, but the, it's influenced mainly by uh, Spanish cuisine, Afri uh, Central African cuisines, and uh, uh, indigenous cuisines with lesser, with a little bit less influence from Arab and Asian cuisines. Uh, uh, for social issues, like uh, approximately 30% 30 30 of the country lives uh, in poverty conditions and is one of the most unequal countries in terms of wealth distribution in Latin America. On the other hand, there is high literacy levels and access to healthcare is uh, secured to all Colombian citizens. So a little bit of background about ourselves. I grew up in Bogota, which is the country's capital. Bogota is a city of about 8 million people. It's located high, high up in the mountains at about 9,000 feet, feet about above sea level, and it has a year-round temperature of 
around 65 degrees Fahrenheit. There's no seasons in Colombia other than a wet season and a, and a dry season. Uh, David grew up in Cali, which is a city of about 2 million people. It, uh, it is lo uh, low above sea level at uh, around 2,000 feet above sea level, and, and, it, has, and it has a year-round temperature of approximately 95, 90 to 95 degrees year-round. So yeah, like I, so there's, there's a high variation in, like in temperature, but it's just based on where you are above sea level. And those there are actual houses. So yeah, so I grew up. There, so it's green year round, and so that's what you see year round. It's green everywhere. So he grew up in a country house in the skirts of Cali, and I grew up in a residential house in a neighborhood in Bogota. Big difference between here and there with with the <laughs> weather and the, the seasons. Yeah. So we come from very traditional upper middle class Colombian families. We grew up in a period in Colombia where uh, violence related to drug trafficking and guerrilla wars was spread out throughout the country. However, growing up, we lived in a privileged world where we were never in like direct contact with that reality, although we knew it existed. We kind of lived protected lives within our bubbles. But that uh, change, that, that bubble burst the first few years of high school. In Colombia, all 10 to 12 uh, grade students have to do community and educational service. As part of that service, you would go every weekend to like a less favored neighborhood or, sc or school, teaching families about the importance of vaccination, birth control, helping with school, uh, homework and school attendance, and assisting with community improvement projects. So up to that point, we never thought about less favored people as anything else than being poor. But during those two years, we learned that these people were also great cooks, skilled soccer players, concerned parents, dedicated students. And we realized that one of the problems of categorization is that it distorts your perception of others because, because you tend to respond to people more as uh, belonging to a certain group instead of as, an, as individuals. So during those two years, we realized that, that by categorizing people within certain groups, uh, we only saw them as poor people or less favored people, but that uh, removed all the other la layers of humanity that they had in themselves. In Colombia, uh, every male over 18 years of age has to go to mandatory military service. Uh, there's a few exceptions, but I ended up being one of the non-exceptions. I actually wanted to be there, and I went and did that. And after that, I went uh, to school, to university in Bogota, where, where Sofia was also in the university. We went to the same university at the same time, and we were both studying biology. Yet, in those three or four years that we were there, we never met each other. And I see pictures of her and her friends. And, and I know all of her friends, but I don't recall ever seeing Sofia, which was pretty interesting. Uh, uh, eventually, we decided, uh, I guess individually, we ended up in, in, the, in the US for different reasons. I, I left because of some security reasons. Sofia came here for school. Uh, eventually, uh, we, we migrated, much like uh, monarchs, wildebeest in Serengeti. We, we, were, we were in search for resources uh, uh, that weren't available there. We came for the resources here. Uh, upon arrival, we were categorized as Hispanics, and, and which actually reflected our cultural and ethnic background. And this was not a bad thing. And, and it actually opened a lot of doors. And uh, speaking more than one language and, and, and our background actually gave us opportunities for scholarships and things that might have not been available otherwise. So, so we never really felt discriminated against. So it, it, was, it was important for us to, to actually own that, that hispanicity and, and, and take advantage of, of that being perceived as different, but yet not being treated as different. So, so that has always been very important to us. So in terms of migrations, on the right and the blue arrows, that's me on the left, it's Sophia, and then it turns purple where we meet. So <laughs> 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 we, 
we met in Las Cruces, New Mexico, actually in Gallup, New Mexico. We were both going to school. We were getting our master's in Las Cruces, New Mexico, but we went for a conference in Gallup, which is fairly remote. And we were there for a conference. And one of the things that brought us together was, was this, this search for some, something that was familiar to us. We, we had, the common denominator was our shared national identities. We were both Colombian. We had heard of each other. We hadn't met, but uh, we, we met. And, and I guess, boom, the magic happened. <laughs> <laughs> then we moved to College Station, Texas. And that's where Matilde was born, our daughter Matilde, which was here with us earlier. And from there, from College Station, Texas, we moved to North Dakota, and, and here we are. So we took the long way around. We've been, we've been in a lot of different places. And we never thought we would end up in oh. North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this happened <laughs> about a month after I moved here, and and it was, <laughs> and it was tough. <laughs> During the st that time, I was still in Texas because I had to let Matilde was going to finishing her kindergarten year at school. And I would talk to David through Facebook and everything, and it was dark here while there was still light there, and like all this snow while we had like 90 degrees. So it was, it was a shock for both of us. <laughs> However, so we've lived in New Mexico, and, and in New Mexico, we, we had the language, but we didn't really feel like we fit in very well. And we were in Texas, and, and we were a lot older than most of our peers. We were there for grad school, and we had a daughter. So we also felt a little different, yet we came here to North Dakota. And even though there's very striking differences between that greenness that you saw earlier and, and this, we, we really feel at home here. We, we have found kind of our niche, and, and even though we, we're still the Hispanics, we, we, we feel like we, we have really found a home here, and, and it feels that way for us. So uh, why do we feel that we belong in some places and not in others? Because human stories are interconnected and although different, our personal stories have a shared place, history, or identity. So as we come to identify with where we live, we shape our environment and in turn are shaped by it. One of the things that we, we liked about North Dakota when we moved here was how progressive it was. All these electric cars plugged in <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> That's a true story. That's a true story. So when Sophia moved here, she's like, wow, I can't believe this. I would have never imagined North Dakota to be that way. So in North Dakota, we have found our own niche from which we can shape our immediate environment with confidence. In this place, we are living our lives as parents, professionals, and community actors. We are still Colombians. But rather than settle into the U.S. fully or remain totally attached to our Colombian family and homeland, we have created a home in North Dakota that speaks about who we are now after more than 15 years of having left our country of origin. Throughout our 40 plus years, 41 to be exact, I think we're both 41 now, we have met many people and developed wonderful friendships. We have also had some interesting jobs, crazy hobbies, and wonderful travel adventures. Our journey has taught us that every individual is defined by multiple factors, that everyone has a life journey worth sharing. We realize now that the relationships and logistics of living in Colombia eh, differ from eh, and do not apply really to what we live here in the US. Our homes and, and lives are sort of an in-between space that reveals and sustains our hybrid identity and varied place attachments suggesting not only how immigration blurs conventional boundaries of place and people, but also offering an insight into shifting spaces, identities, and cultures worldwide. So those are all pictures of us in North Dakota. Whoops, I'm supposed to be right there. In his book, Living to Tell the Tale, Gabriel Garcia Marquez wrote that life is not one lived but one remember, the one one remembers and how one remembers it in order to recount it. And so we try to live our lives by creating lasting memories created by being true to ourselves while trying not to deny others as we would like them to be, define others as we would like them to be, sorry, by keeping all our cultural roots alive and passing them on to future generations while trying to adapt to our immediate environment by maintaining our autonomy as individuals while listening to others with openness, by being grateful for what we have accomplished while striving for improvement, 
because we want to be remembered as people who, whose individual stories were made up of multiple stories, some passed on to us by our parents, some created by ourselves, and some that we will pass on to future generations. So uh, we hope you can take a moment to reflect on the stories you have lived and uh, how we, you would like those stories to be recounted, just much like we have done with ourselves. We, we feel like uh, through, through these stories, we have lived many different lives. And many of you, of you probably can relate uh, when, when we were asked, like, where are you from? It, it takes a while to think of where are we really from because of all these stories that we've lived and all these places that we've been. Uh, we, we, we have different stories for all these different places and, and feel that we've brought some of that with us from all those different places where we've lived. And with that, we would like to leave you with this quote by Thomas Berry, who was a Catholic a priest and an eco-theologian, which up to a few days ago, I had no idea what that meant, but it has to do with the connection between theology and, and, and ecology and ecosystems. And uh, so the natural world is lar uh, the larger sacred community to which we belong. To be alienated from this community is to become destitute and all that makes us human. To damage this community is to diminish our own existence. And this is very important to us as biologists, ecologists, and people who strive to make this world a better place through the science that we do. Thank you. Words come from another poem called We Are Many by Pablo Neru Neruda. <laughs> um, but when I call upon my dashing being, out comes the old lazy self. And so I never know just who I am nor how many I am, nor who we will be being. I would like to be able to touch a bell and call up my real self, the truly me, because if I really need my proper self, I must not allow myself to disappear. While I am writing, I am far away, and when I come back, I have already left. I should like to see if the same thing happens to other people as it does to me, to see if as many people are as I am, and if they seem the same way to themselves. When this problem has been thoroughly explored, I am going to school myself so well in things that when I try to explain my problems, I shall speak not of self, but of geography.